This lecture is about how to analyze torts questions, in particular negligence questions. But before I focus on how to analyze negligence questions, let me put this in perspective because I think it'll be helpful to do that. The bar examiners are testing you for three things. They want to know, number one, do you know the rules of law well enough? Number two, do you know how to use those rules of law to analyze a fact situation? And number three, can you communicate it in writing? Those are the three things they want to know. Do you know the rules well enough? Can you use them well enough to analyze fact situations? And can you communicate it in writing? Now, on the first of those, knowing the rules well enough, let me remind you of something that I said on one of the free videos, uh, that there are about five to 6,000 rules that you are expected to know when you graduate from law school. And I show you on that video how to calculate that. Now, you can calculate it two or three different ways. You get about the same results. About 6, 000, five to 6,000 rules that you are expected to know. Uh, now, at, there are about 15 subjects on the California bar exam. So if you take the 6,000 rules that you are expected to know and you divide those by the 15 subjects, you get about 400 rules per subject. So the bar examiners expect you, on the average, to know about 400 rules per subject. Some subjects, uh, there are more rules and some less, but the average, about 400. Now, uh, the way you learn those rules is by reading the long outlines, if you're using the Barbary outlines, or by reading the bar passer outlines, if you're using the full bar passer outlines. Or if we're talking about torts, you can read the manuals outlines. You can read the Gilbert's outlines, okay? But you need to read some uh, material such as that. Uh, obviously, the manuals and Gilbert's are even more thorough. But you need to read that material. And reading summaries of that material is not enough, okay? You won't know the average of 400 rules or so that you are expected to know. Now, and those rules, let me remind you, the bar examiners want you to know the words of the rule. I mean, the actual words of the rule, awfully close. And some general idea about here's kind of sort of more or less what the idea is behind the rule will not do. They want you to know the actual words of the rule. And there's about 400 of them per subject. Now, the next thing they want you to, and you learn those by doing the reading that we talked about. The next thing is that you need to be able to use those rules to analyze facts. You have to practice using the rules to analyze facts like any other body of knowledge. Mathematics has got a lot of rules, but you have to pra use, practice using those rules to analyze uh, fact situations. On the bar, uh, if uh, someone uh, was uh, riding a bicycle and the handlebars came off, the person lost control of the bicycle and got hit by a truck, and now they're badly injured, uh, can you use the rules of tort law, those 400 on the average, probably more, can you use the, do you know how to use those rules to analyze that fact situation to decide what the outcome ought to be? And you have to practice using the rules or you won't be able to do it well enough for purposes of the bar. You do practice and that's what this course is all about. Someone, for example, gets arrested and the question is, did the officer really have probable cause? Well, they want you to know what the rules are and to have practice in applying the rules to this fact, to a fact situation so that you can analyze this fact situation to decide what the outcome ought to be. You have to practice using the rules. And that's what this course is about, a lot of that. You're, that's what we do. Thirdly, the bar examiners want to know, can you communicate it in writing? Can you communicate your analysis in writing? This course, of course, is very heavy on exactly that, communicating your analysis in writing. Homework, practice exams, writing PTs is all about that. So in that sense, 
And that, with that perspective in mind, we're now going to study the law of torts, in particular the negligence aspect of it. We're going through the rules. We're going to review what the rules are about, and hopefully this will add understanding to how, to how you might use the rules, because I'll do examples. And then we will turn to some bar questions, and we will use these rules to analyze the facts in that bar question. And that's what the, and then we'll, I'll tell you what you should write. And that's what the bar examiners want to see you do, analyze and write. Let's um, begin then by, first of all, noticing that uh, on the California bar exam, a tort summary here over the last 20 years of questions here are the number of negligence torts questions, eight negligence, four in products liability, eight of them, four of them in defamation, et cetera. And when I say defamation, et cetera, I mean the other closely related torts, you know, the ones defamation, invasion of privacy, intentional infliction of severe emotional distress, those three torts go together. Four of them were about that, and two of the torts questions were about the intentional torts, assault, battery, trespass, that sort of stuff. Uh, that's a total of 20 torts questions over the last 40 bars. And so about half of the bar exams have torts questions, and here's how they're broken out. Now tonight we're studying the negligence and so let's begin with our cause of action for negligence. The, keep in mind that the, uh, when uh, you apply a rule of law, a rule of law has uh, uh, requirements, has elements, components, subcomponents. And these rules have subcomponents all the way down to where the rule meets the facts. You know, how do you recover for uh, negligence? Answer, duty, the elements to recover are duty, breach, causation, damages. And each of these have subcomponents. What do you mean by duty? What do you mean by breach? What do you mean by causation and, and damages? And these, these rules have subcomponents. And the subcomponents may have sub subcomponents and so forth. And so you uh, uh, continue until finally the components of the rule meet the facts. And that's where you argue that the facts that we have satisfy these subcomponents of the rule. And then you work your way back up to the larger branches. And that's how analysis is done. Now, uh, so that in the case of uh, tort law, in the case of negligence, the requirements are duty, breach, causation, and damages, and the subcomponents, et cetera. The key point that I wanted to emphasize is that when you do your analysis, when you do your analysis, the way you must do it, you have to be looking at the requirements that have to be satisfied. If somebody wants to recover for negligence, what requirements does the plaintiff have to satisfy? Duty was owed to the defend, uh, pardon me, the, 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 the duty was owed to the plaintiff. The duty was breached, causation, the damages. Um, and so these are the, the requirements these are the, that the plaintiff has to satisfy. And each of the further one, duty, you know, who owes what duty to whom? What's the rule of law about that? And so finally, you keep breaking it down to where the rules intersect with the facts, and you try to prove that your facts satisfy these little pieces of the rule and work your way back up. And the reason I'm emphasizing this, and even said it twice, is because that's the way your analysis should look, okay? Your analysis should not be a review of the facts that you're given and you drag in a piece of law from time to time. That's not legal analysis. Legal analysis is where 
you look at how the law is organized and what the requirements are, then after you've traced the requirements all the way out to the details, then you say, our facts, these facts satisfy these requirements. And you look at each requirement to see, is this requirement satisfied, is this one satisfied, and so forth. So your analysis is consists of using the rules of law and showing you've got the facts to satisfy the requirements of the rule. It does not, that is a rule-driven analysis, or sometimes referred to as an element-driven analysis. So your analysis is about the use of the elements. It's not, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, the facts come in at the very end. Now, when you get ready to argue that I've got the facts here to satisfy uh, a breaking, or I have the facts to satisfy, that, to show that this was a foreseeable plaintiff. This is a foreseeable plaintiff because the plaintiff was riding next to the defendant who was driving the car, riding in the car, and that's a foreseeable plaintiff. This plaintiff was the patient that the doctor was treating. This is a foreseeable plaintiff. So you've got the facts to show that this is a foreseeable plaintiff. Wherever, when the facts meet the rule, that's the place where you have the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, some policies behind the rule, because uh, the when you uh, the 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 facts, I mean, how how scanty can the facts be, how and still satisfy the rule, and that's where you can talk about. Well, here's the policy behind the rule, and given that policy, these facts ought to be enough. That's how you pick up your extra points if you know something about policy behind the rule. But that happens out at the point where the rule meets the facts. And that's what you study in, in law school. The case law in law school is about examples of these, uh, these elements, examples where the court said, this was enough to satisfy a breaking. And some other courts say, oh, this part, this is not enough to satisfy a breaking. And it's those examples that you learn in law school when you study the case law. But the bar examiners, want you to know, you know enough about the example so you can fit yours on. But again, in summary, the analysis is analysis going, out the going down the structure. Okay? It's using the structure and showing each component of the structure is satisfied. When you get to the facts, the facts satisfy those fine details of the structure, and then you work your way back out. And that is the kind of analysis that gets you a high grade, an analysis that it, where the rules, you don't know the words of the rule, and you give fuzzy descriptions of the words of the rule, will cost points. And those places where you don't know the rule at all, that will cost points. And those places where you, you analyze by just talking about the facts, and you know, don't even drag the rules in, that'll cost you points. And so <coughs> the way to get the highest points is the way we talked about. Now we're talking about negligence questions here, the elements are duty, breach, causation, and damages. Let's talk about what <clears throat> the bar examiners want you to know about duty. Duty, right here. <clears throat> the idea <clears throat> of someone being negligent, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea of somebody being negligent is that uh, uh, the, the public policy imposes a duty on everybody that says, no matter what you are doing, we the public say that you owe a duty of reasonable care to the people who you should realize might be injured by whatever you're doing. If you're walking down the street driving a car, uh, uh, you know, coughing in an emergency room, whatever you are doing that the public policy imposes on each of us a duty, and that duty is the duty to act with reasonable care towards those persons who you should realize might be injured by whatever you're doing. Okay? That is this duty right here. And now you see uh, some fuzzy boundaries there. And that's what the cases are about. And that's what the bar examiners want to know if you know how to deal with these fuzzy boundaries. We say the duty is owed to
to the people you ought to realize might be injured by what you're doing, well, those are your foreseeable plaintiffs. So you owe a duty to these foreseeable plaintiffs, and obviously, whether or not a particular plaintiff is foreseeable or not is a fuzzy boundary. And that's where the questions are going to come in. Give us a, your theory as to whether or not this kind of a plaintiff is foreseeable or not. So public policy, you owe a duty to foreseeable plaintiffs. And secondly, that duty is to exercise reasonable care. Well, there's another fuzzy boundary. What do you mean by reasonable care? And the bar examiners will present you with situations, and you need to decide whether or not this was reasonable care. And they don't want your personal social opinion. There are some rules that help you evaluate whether or not some particular care was reasonable or not. They want to see, do you know those rules, and can you put them to use here? And then finally, they'll ask you to communicate it in writing. Okay? Now, so back here, the duty then, uh, for purposes of the bar exam, there are two parts of duty that you need to be aware of, the rules. One is, this rule here is, what duty is owed? How much carefulness does society impose on you? And secondly, to whom is the duty owed? Because it's only those people to whom the duty is owed that can get a, uh, it's only the people to whom the duty is owed that can, uh, uh, that have a cause of action. And if no duty was owed to you, you, you can't argue breach of duty. So, the two parts of duty, and you pick up points by dealing with these separately in the bar exam, the two parts are, num uh, first, how much care is owed and to whom is it owed? Well, how much care is owed depends on what you're doing at the time. And there are, three, there are three levels of activity that are recognized by the law. One is if you're doing ordinary things, then you owe the duty of due care. This due care is also called ordinary care, is called uh, uh, ordinary care, is called uh, reasonable care, it's called uh, uh, any names like that, due care and reasonable care. So you have a duty here, the level of care is ordinary care or reasonable care. But uh, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, what, I, what I want to point out <coughs> is that this idea of exercise reasonable care is sometimes put in another way. And sometimes it's put in this way. It said, do not create unreasonable risk of harm to these foreseeable plaintiffs do not create unreasonable risk of harm. And that's another way of saying act with reasonable care. But it's said in both ways, and I just want you to be aware of both of those. So, ordinary activities, one owes a duty of due care. Certain activities, one owes a duty of extraordinary care. And those are limited to two kinds of activities. And those activities are the uh, uh, and innkeepers and common carriers. Innkeepers and common carriers. And sometimes, in some jurisdictions rather, uh, the public utilities are obligated to exercise extraordinary care while they are engaged in their public utilities activity. If you're talking about the phone company, it's while they're laying their phone lines not while they're driving their truck down the street like everybody else. But when they're engaged in the utility activity, some states say they owe a duty of extraordinary care. Now, so the, the, the situations then where there is a duty of extraordinary care are those where innkeepers, common carriers, and some states public utilities. Finally, if you are engaged in abnormally dangerous or sometimes called ultra-hazardous activities, okay, if you're engaged in ultra-hazardous activities, the, uh, uh, then you can, um, you're required to exercise not just reasonable care, not just extraordinary care, but 
you have a duty to make it safe. Trying to make it safe doesn't count. You gotta make it safe. So if you're dynamiting or engaged in any other type of ultra hazardous activities, the duty is to make it safe. We call that strict liability, meaning if somebody gets injured because of your blasting, you're liable, period, so long as the injury was caused by the blasting. Doesn't matter how careful you are. So if you're engaged in those kinds of activities, then the duty is to make it safe. And the fuzzy boundary now is right here. And that is, how do you decide whether or not a particular activity is an ultra-hazardous activity or not? Okay, How do you decide if it's ultra-hazardous? Um, is fumigating a warehouse an ultra-hazardous activity? Uh, blasting would be pretty obvious, that is. What about uh, engaging in cattle virus research? Suppose that's going on right in the middle of a cattle virus, a cattle community. Is that an ultra-hazardous activity? And so forth. You dumped waste, chemical waste, into the river. Or is, or, and uh, uh, so anyway, the point is that you can see that there are many situations that are on the boundary uh, as to whether or not that activity is ultra-hazardous. And if it's an activity that's on the boundary, you need to pull out your rules to that, uh, the factors that you use to help to decide whether or not that activity is ultra-hazardous. These factors are here and they're contained in your book. There are six of them. These are at the restatement section 520. Restatement section 520 will give you those six factors and you need to know them. Because if you're given some event that's on the boundary, that's uh, a good way to decide. So this determines how much duty is owed and um, the next question under duty is to whom is that duty owed? You don't owe it to everybody in the world if you are driving your car in San Francisco, California. You don't owe a duty to drive with due care to people in Calcutta, India, okay? Because those people are not folks that you could foresee might be injured by what you're doing. So they're not foreseeable plaintiffs. But if you're practicing medicine and you got a patient, that patient obviously is the person who might be injured, could reasonably be injured by your negligence. And so the foreseeable plaintiff is the person that a reasonable person would realize is in a position who might be injured by what you're doing. We also have another name for that, don't we? We say those are the people in the zone of danger. Okay, that's another fancy way of saying that, zone of danger. Now, so the foreseeable plaintiff is the person who's in the zone of danger, and uh, that can be obvious in a typical bar question because the plaintiff can be a passenger in the defendant's car or the uh, uh, pedestrian on the road that was hit and so forth. So in many cases, to whom is the duty owed, it's a simple problem because obviously you owe this person a duty, they're nearby. But you obviously can see how this person who got injured can get more and more and more removed from what the plaintiff, from what the defendant is doing. What the, you know, uh, the person who got injured, the plaintiff, I'm, watch my language here. The person who got injured gets more and more and more removed from the conduct of the person who caused the harm. And you can see at some point you wouldn't foresee this plaintiff, they're too remote. And so the bar questions are gonna come down, if they're testing this area, they're gonna come in with a situation where this plaintiff is kind of, re where the injured person is somewhat remote from the person who did whatever they did wrong. For example, there was a bar question where a uh, plumber had uh, uh, connected two uh, pipes together the pipes were made of different metals, and the, planer did, the, plan, the plumber did not use a plastic connector. Over a period of a few years, the metals who were, which were connected together were incompatible. They corroded a hole, uh, uh, you know, was etched into the pipe, and the hot water under pressure came out the pipe, 
and it scalded a customer who was in the swimming suit store, damaged a whole lot of swimming suits because the water was scalding hot. And there was an employee who was working in the store, and this employee now had uh, to be laid off because the store had to be closed for a while. And so the employee now sues the plumber, uh, assuming the statute of limitations has not run. This employee sues the plumber saying, your negligence in connecting those pipes uh, uh, it caused me to lose five days' work, or three months' work it was, and I want you to pay me. Well, when that plumber is plumbing the pipes and does so negligently, who are the foreseeable plaintiffs? Is this uh, employee in a store? Forgetting about the, the passage of time, suppose it happened a month later instead of a couple of years later. Should I, as a plumber, foresee this employee in the store who's going to lose her job for a while because I'm plumbing negligently? So you see the point. The question becomes, uh, you know, the foreseeability of these plaintiffs. When do they become foreseeable, uh, unforeseeable? And uh, it's obviously a public policy decision because uh, you, you can make people responsible as far as you want. So the public policy under the, is that no, that the uh, plumber that should not, the, that the person who lost their employment for three months in this real bark question, that uh, that person's name was Emma. Uh, Emma was not a foreseeable plaintiff so far as, the, uh, as to the plumber who was doing the plumbing negligently. And we just draw the line as a matter of public policy. Obviously, the plumber caused it. But we're saying, no, nope, plumber doesn't have to look that far ahead. Uh, if you didn't do that, uh, let me change the facts a bit. And instead of Emma being the one employee who was out of work for three months, and instead of the plumber connecting some pipes together negligently, let me change the facts just a little bit. This is now an electrician who works at the power company and the electrician was negligent. And the way the ne electrician was negligent is that he or she dropped a wrench into the big transformer that supplies the power to this uh, factory, to this automobile factory, where 10,000 people come to work every day. But because this wrench got dropped in there through negligence, these people can't come to work for three days until they get it repaired. And so all 10,000 of these people should then sue the electrician who dropped the, the pipe, the wrench. Of course, they'd be suing the electrical company. All 10,000 saying, we're all out of work for three days, and we want to be paid. And you could do that if you wanted. The public really wanted to do that. But you can see that's not a reasonable way to run the society. And so the way we formally draw that line to say that the electrician or the plumber did not uh, sh that did not owe these employees a duty of care. We just draw the line there and say, nope, they are not foreseeable plaintiffs. Another way this sort of thing happens is when you see this being tested, uh, is where, uh, and the one I just gave you about Emma, the employee, was tested. There was another one about the 10,000 people in the, uh, the electrical company that was on a performance test. Uh, and uh, I'll give you one more example. And this is the case where I, a person uh, had an accident on the freeway. In uh, the case, it's in the, one of the tunnels in New York. But let's suppose that it's on a bridge uh, in uh, San Francisco, California, for example. A bridge coming into the city, and there is our free, any freeway. It's an accident. It's a simple accident, but it tied up several lanes of the freeway so that there's over a thousand cars and trucks lined up who can't get by. And by the time the tow trucks come and all that sort of stuff happen, you know, people are all late, an hour late to work. And so now you've got over a thousand people lined up who are an hour late to work. Uh, do you want to allow them to sue these people who had this little fender bender accident? And everybody sued for $50 for their loss of an hour's worth of work. And so now you've got this huge liability. 
and you've got a court system that gets 10,000 lawsuits filed every day, okay, and the answer is no. You don't want to run your society in a way that these 10,000 people lined up behind this simple accident can all sue these people for their loss of time. And so what, how do we terminate that legally? And the way we do it legally is we say, these people who had the simple accident did not, they, they do, it's done in two different ways. Some states say, these people who had the accident did not owe a duty to these people behind them not to delay them in this way. They just don't owe them that duty as a matter of public policy. Or the other way to do it is to say that at the proximate causation level, that even though the fender-bender accident caused them to be late, that proximate causation is about where out the chain of events does the public policy terminate somebody's liability? You're not liable forever for, every, for the, out the chain. Where do you terminate? And that's also a public policy decision that you see implemented in the case law. And so in this, in this uh, freeway accident case I'm telling you about, uh, many states say that, that as a matter of public policy, even though this, these drivers were the actual cause of the delay, they were not the legal cause of the delay. The law doesn't recognize the cause. We know you caused it, but the law doesn't recognize that cause because we don't want to run our society that way. So we say you're, that they were not the proximate cause or not the legal cause. So you see how this concept of to whom is the duty owed get tested. Those are all real examples that I gave you. Uh, one more real example that I'll give you quickly on this issue of to whom is the duty owed. Uh, there is a problem uh, on the bar exam in which uh, a, a train company hauled toxic materials uh, uh, on their tracks going someplace to dispose of it. And these toxic uh, materials that were being hauled, the train uh, driver uh, had a heart attack and had had a heart problem, had a heart attack five years ago. Recovered, they put him back, he's driving this train, he had an attack, the train derailed, the toxic materials spilled, the people in the neighborhood fled, and uh, the, uh, and one of the people fled and wouldn't come back for six months to open his store, and he wants to get paid for all that time. Now, before this accident happened, the train company hired a woman named Diana, who was an expert in evaluating the likelihood of and how badly, how bad damage would occur if spills like this occurred. And she did a study for Transco, and she reported to Stan, a report to them saying, if a spillage such as a derailing of these toxic materials should occur, that the damage would not be lasting and would not be severe. That was her report. Now, when this train thing did overturn, uh, the question is, do the injured parties have a right to sue her? And the answer is in two parts. First of all, turns out that she was right because the problem went on to say there wasn't any lasting damage. This person was freaked out, wouldn't come back and open their shop for six months, but that's because of him and that's some special problems there. But in general, there were no lasting events uh, and so Diana was right, first of all. But secondly, even if she had been wrong, and let's suppose for the moment that she was wrong, even if she had been wrong, did Diana owe a duty of due care to those people who had real estate along the railroad tracks? You see the problem? Did she owe them a duty of any kind? And so if she was negligent in her report, and she was not, but if she was, uh, did she owe them a duty? Or did she only owe her duty to Transco who hired her? Okay, and the law based again on public policy is Diana did not, not, not owe a duty of anything to those people who had property along the tracks. Okay, they're too removed from what she's doing and as a matter of public policy, we say no, she does not owe them a duty of, uh, of anything. 
this also happened. The bar examiners are fond of testing this stuff. Well, these are all real bar examples, so you can see how fond they are. One final example, uh, a case of an, uh, an accounting firm who did uh, a, an annual financial uh, report for a major company, General Motors, and uh, made a mistake in the financial report and large numbers of people traded stock on the basis of that mistake in the financial report. And so these people who lost money trading the stock on the basis of that mistake sued Touche Roth, which was the big accounting firm that did this, sued them for negligence. And once again, the court said, no, Touche Roth does not owe those people uh, a duty of due care or anything else. Uh, now, you can say, but those, it's clearly foreseeable that if you give a faulty financial report, that people are going to rely on a trade stock and get hurt. And yeah, it is foreseeable in that sense. But we're not talking about whether or not it was in fact foreseeable. We're asking whether or not, as a matter of law, we're going to recognize it as foreseeable. Or are we going to draw the uh, public policy line before you get there? And the answer is that in the case of the two Ross accounting firm, the public policy is no. We did, they did not owe those shareholders who traded a duty of due care. They only owed care to the person they dealt with. And again, it's a matter of the public policy. The people behind you on the freeway, when you have an accident, they are very foreseeable, in fact. When we hear it on the radio every day, there's an accident and people are delayed. So they're obviously foreseeable. But there's a difference between whether they are socially foreseeable and whether or not the law is going to draw the line by saying we're going to treat them as though they are not foreseeable, so that legally they are not foreseeable. OK, so we understand about the duty and how we deal with these uh, remote plaintiffs, foreseeable plaintiff, uh, remote plaintiffs. This is the Paul's graph case. Recall that in the Paul's graph case, the, the remoteness happened in a slightly different way. That's a case where the conductor helping the person get on to the train who had the fireworks and dropped the fireworks and all these explosions went off and people stampeded across the platform and Mrs. Paul's graph was way over on the other side of the platform. So now the question becomes this um, conductor who was helping the person get on the train was allegedly negligent. So if that person was negligent, they obviously owed a duty to the person they were helping get on the train but did they owe a duty to Mrs. Paul's graph was way on the other side of the platform? Okay, and that's what that, that's your remote plaintiff. And the question is, does she owe a duty? And that's where the Paul's graph split comes. Uh, the Andrews view was yes. The Cardoza view was no. And the country is still divided. Now, um, so we understand these duty issues. What duty is owed depends on who, what you're doing. Uh, to whom the duty is owed, you owe it to all foreseeable plaintiffs. But, 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 the idea of who is a foreseeable plaintiff is a legal concept, not just a social one. Obviously, the person needs to be socially foreseeable first. But just because they are socially foreseeable, doesn't mean that the law is going to recognize them as foreseeable, so that ultimately the concept of who is a foreseeable plaintiff turns on whether the law recognizes that person as foreseeable. And you've heard enough examples today to deal with that and the Paul's graph case. And finally, uh, this question of to whom a duty is owed, uh, there are some special relations which we will deal with, or I will deal with, on a separate video. For example, those cases where you have a landlord uh, who just rented a place to a tenant and the customers come onto the premises and the customer gets injured. Well, is the landlord who just leased it liable? Is the person, the lessee, liable? Are they both liable? Um, what is the standard of care and to whom is it owed in those kinds of situations? 
What about those cases um, where um, you, you have an employee who is acting on behalf of the employer and does things that injure somebody? Um, when are they within the scope of their employment activities and when are they not? And there are a bunch of these other situations. What do you do in cases where the, uh, you have a contract and you're functioning uh, pursuant to the contract but do so negligently? Can you bring the action in tort or contract or which one? That whole little class of problems are those cases where there are special relationships and I will make a separate video dealing with these. And it will be called special relationships in uh, tort duty. So I think we understand the whole problem of duty at this point. I've given lots of examples. Um, the next comes breach of duty. Now, the, let me point out first of all that if the duty, that it, the, only the people to whom the duty was owed can sue. But if the duty was owed to them, how do you decide when the duty was breached? And the answer is, in one case, is dirt simple. And that's the case where the duty is to make it safe. If I am dynamiting, if I'm doing any abnormally dangerous activity, as you can determine from Restatement Section 520, which I ask, urge you to read and memorize, that's one of those 6,000 rules. Uh, the second restatement, by the way. Uh, and so if I'm engaged in some uh, ultra-hazardous activity, in, and once you've established that I'm engaged in an ultra-hazardous activity, my duty is to make it safe. Okay? There was a question on the bar exam where a company had a warehouse that kept people's furniture. And they fumigate the warehouse every once in a while because rodents will get in there and destroy people's furniture. So they hired a fumigation company to come and fumigate the warehouse. Uh, the, uh, and two things went wrong in the course of the fumigation. One is that the gases that they were using to fumigate the warehouse, some of those gases escaped. And a guy, a person named Otis in the next door building was injured, poisoned, by, because of these escaping poison gases. And one of the things that happened is that Otis sued. Otis sued the company doing the fumigation, and they sued the warehouse company also. And you see the issues there. And obviously, and the facts told you, that the fumigation company took all, all, of the usual precautions in sealing the building. So they're telling you the fumigation company was not negligent. Obviously, the question is, was the fumigation activity an ultra-hazardous activity? Because if it's ultra-hazardous, we don't care how careful the fumigation company was. So that's when you would use over here on the board these factors uh, to decide whether or not fumigation is an ultra-hazardous activity. And right here, I'll write them on the board for you. The second restatement, section 520, has the six factors there. Second restatement, section 5, and please learn them. They're worth memorizing. Uh, it can come up on the multiple choice part of the exam, and it can come up on the essay. So um, uh, learn them. So, the, well, if the fumigation company was engaged in an ultra-hazardous activity, uh, then, the, uh, 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 then they are strictly liable, doesn't matter how careful they were, and Otis is entitled to recover. Also, as I'm sure you know, the owner of the warehouse will be liable because if, they, if it was an ultra-hazardous activity, they cannot delegate their, their responsibility to somebody else. They, they all, both of them are strictly liable. So, uh, and again, that's the situation where you needed to know uh, how to decide if the activity is um, an ultra-hazardous one. And that's a real bar question. So, the point I'm getting at here is how do you decide when the duty 
has been breached. And I said to you, in one case, it's dirt simple. And that's a case where the duty is the duty to make safe because the defendant was engaged in an ultra-hazardous activity. Well, they didn't make it safe, and so Otis, in our hypothetical, can recover because the duty is to make safe. doesn't matter how careful they were. There was another example of exactly that where a, a cattle virus research company was engaged in cattle virus activity, and this company was located right in the middle of a cattle virus, of a cattle community. And so if those viruses ever got out, the havoc that it would play with that community, very devastating. Once again, you see how, what you need to do. You, if you need to decide whether or not this is an ultra hazardous activity, put it through the restatement, section 520, and uh, make your decision. Now, um, the, uh, and, and so uh, if, the, uh, if the activity is an ultra hazardous activity, the duty to make safe, the breach is very easy, okay? They didn't make it safe, it caused injury, and that's that. The case, of course, in, in, in the case where the bar examiners are testing strict liability, the points, the points at this point will have been allocated, allocated over to the question of was this an ultra-hazardous activity, if that's where the analysis needs to be and make that decision. So there'll be a lot of points allocated to that decision if you needed analysis there. Um, whereas on the breach part, was the duty breach was just one line. Yeah, they didn't make it safe, it's breached. Um, in the case where, st sticking for the moment with the case of ultra-hazardous activity, I want to give you one more piece of information and we want to move ahead. And that piece of information is right here. I say to you that you can use the restatement section 520, those six factors there, to help decide, and these are factors, these are not requirements, they're factors. You can use these six factors to help decide whether or not the uh, activity is ultra-hazardous. And if the activity, but there is uh, one other way that you can also decide whether or not the activity is ultra-hazardous. And that other way is that there is a common law rule regarding abnormal and dangerous activity. And the common law rule says, if the activity cannot be made safe by ordinary or due care, that is an abnormally dangerous activity. So there's a common law rule that says what I just said. If you can't make it safe by the exercise of ordinary care, that's an abnormally dangerous activity. That's a second and independent way you might show that the activity is ultra-hazardous. In the case of the virus that I told you about, the facts in that case said that the viruses escaped without negligence by the research company. So since they told you it was without negligence, you had to establish that this was an ultra-hazardous activity and you could do it either way. Do it both ways to get most points. There. The common law says it was done, they escaped without negligence <clears throat> and they still couldn't make it safe even though they were not negligent. That's, you know, abnormally dangerous. But do them both ways. Uh, in the case of the uh, escaping, uh, in the case of the escaping gases that were Otis got injured, do it both ways. Now, um, so we know what to do if the duty is the duty to exercise, um, to to make safe. But if the duty is not that high standard, make safe, but it's a duty to exercise reasonable care to the foreseeable plaintiffs. And we got a foreseeable plaintiff because they were riding in the seat next to the driver or something. So we got a foreseeable plaintiff and so you owe them reasonable care. Did the person breach the duty of reasonable care? And that obviously is a fuzzy boundary. Reasonable care, when did you breach that duty? And once again, the bar examiners want you to know some rules. If you tell them what your personal social opinion is about whether or not this was reasonable care, you don't need to go to law school to do that. 
that will not get you the points. But if you drag out the rules for deciding what's reasonable care, then uh, that's how you get the points. And so right here are a summary of these rules. We're going to take our break and come back and go through each one of them. But there are four ways in which you might uh, uh, decide whether or not an activity constituted a breach of duty of ordinary or reasonable or due care. And we're going to look at each of these one by one, but now is a good time to take a 10-minute break. We're going to do likewise, and we will see you in 10 minutes. <laughs>